Shalom, everyone. My name is Medim Shachar. I am an educator and guide at the Ghetto Fighters House. Before I introduce our guest speaker, I would like to take a moment to remind our global audience to, that today, November 8th, is the eve of the 82nd anniversary of Kristallnacht, or the Night of Broken Glass, that took place between November 9th and 10th, 1938, throughout Germany and Austria, and is considered by many to be the prelude to the Holocaust. As I was reading Professor Kassel's book, Who Will Write Our History, I found a very interesting passage about Emanuel Wingenblum, who was in charge of a relief effort for thousands of Polish Jews who were literally pushed across the border from Germany to Poland between October 25th and 27th, just days before Kristallnacht. And Professor Kassel writes, Wingenblum did not neglect his duties as an historian. He encouraged the refugees to write down their experiences and hope to use the material for future research. He understood that this was an important subject. The Bachshin, which was quickly followed by the Kristallnacht, was an ominous harbinger of Nazi brutality. In, 19, in 2020, with a global rise in anti-Semitism, as well as acts of hate against other minorities, we can use this day of commemoration to continue our collective battle to fight against such acts of hate and believe in the strength of society to stand up against those who want to propagate the hate. And now, on behalf of the Ghetto Fighters House and our CEO, Egal Cohen, who is with us this evening, I am honored to introduce our distinguished speaker, Professor Samuel Cassell. Professor Cassell, Charles Northern Professor of History at Trinity College, is the author of many studies on Russian and Jewish history, including Who Will Write Our History, Emmanuel Ringenblum, the Warsaw Ghetto, and the Onik Shabbat Archive, which was selected by the Jewish Book Council as runner-up for the 2007 National Jewish Book Award and was the winner of the 2008 American Association for the Advancement of Slavic Studies Orbis Book Prize for Polish Studies. Kassel was part of the scholarly team that planned the Pauline Museum of the History of Polish Jews in Warsaw and is currently engaged in a project organized by Yad Vashem to write a history of the Holocaust in Poland. He's been a visiting professor at several universities, including Harvard, Toronto, and Dartmouth. Today, Professor Kassel will be talking about cultural resistance in the Warsaw Ghetto, Emanuel Ringenblum, and the Oinig Shabbos Archive, a subject that, is, that has a special place at the Ghetto Fighter's house. His work on the Oinig Shabbat Archive has contributed not only to our knowledge about the difficult and tragic lives of the Jewish community in the Warsaw Ghetto during the Holocaust, during the catastrophe, but it's helped us gain a deeper awareness of the struggle to leave behind a testimony of their existence, of their individual lives, and of their resistance. His insights have been a guiding light in our work at the Ghetto Fighters House, and we thank him not only for his important historical research, but for his friendship as well. Professor Castle, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much for that nice introduction. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. And uh, now I'm going to uh, try the technology. I will try share screen. Uh, okay. Do you do you see that? Yes. Yes. Oh, very well. Good. Okay, uh, thank you very much for this invitation. And uh, it's uh, really a uh, pleasure to be able to uh, speak once again uh, about Emanuel Ringelblum, who uh, organized one of the most important and one of the most successful projects of what we might call Amida, cultural and spiritual resistance in Nazi-occupied Europe, that is organizing the secret uh, Oynik Shabbos, I'm using the Yiddish uh, pronunciation, the secret Oynik Shabbos, Oynik Shabbat archive in the Warsaw Ghetto. Uh, just about a week before he was uh, captured and then later murdered by the Germans, uh, he wrote one of his last letters to uh, his friend, uh, Adolf Berman, 
uh, whose archive, of course, is at Lochamea Getaot. And in this letter, Ringelblum asked, if none of us live to see the liberation, if none of us survive, what will happen to the OS? What will happen to the Einik Shabbos? And he had good reason to worry because by the time uh, the liberation came, of the 60 or so people that Ringelblum had brought into this extraordinary project, there were only three survivors. Uh, Hirschwasser, Blumewasser, and Rochel Auerbach. And uh, of those three survivors, only Hirschwasser knew where the archive had been buried. He survived by very slim margins, once jumping from a train, taking him to Treblinka. Uh, these three survivors cajoled, uh, begged, uh, buttonholed, people after the war saying, you have to find this treasure that we buried uh, under the school in the Warsaw Ghetto on Novolipki 68. You have to find this. This is a national treasure. And after a lot of difficulties, they finally were able to convince uh, various Jewish authorities to begin the search, to finance the search. Uh, money came from the United States, from the Joint Distribution Committee, from the Jewish Labor Committee. But it wasn't so easy to say, well, let's find what's buried under Novolipki 68. If you've seen what Warsaw looked like in 1945 and 1946, and here you have an idea of what the former ghetto looked like, after the battle uh, of the Warsaw Ghetto in April 43, after the Polish uprising in August and September 44, the whole city was just one massive rubble. And it was hard to know where a street had been, much less where a building had been. But bringing together surveyors and engineers, using pre-war aerial photographs, triangulating from a church spire that had still survived, they were able more or less to figure out where the building had been. They began to dig. And um, on September 18th, 1946, a shovel hit what turned out to be the first of 10 tin boxes. And uh, uh, this was the uh, uh, first cache of the archive which was buried in August 1942. I mentioned, by the way, that Hirschwasser, whose back is to the camera, you see Hirschwasser uh, taking out these tin or zinc boxes uh, the day that they found that first cache of the archive. And the person handing this to him, Michal Borvich, who, uh, 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 became uh, another one of the early Holocaust uh, historians. He also survived by a thin margin. He was actually hanged in the Anovska labor camp in Lvov, but the rope broke, and uh, the German uh, commander, being a gentleman, decided they wouldn't hang him again, and then he made his escape from the camp. And uh, like Wasser, Borvich played a very important role in collecting uh, uh, materials after the war. But, that, but when Wasser realized that there were only 10 boxes, uh, he said, we buried a lot more. There has to be more. But they looked and looked and they couldn't find more. And besides, uh, a lot of water had entered into the boxes. A lot of documents uh, were damaged. There was a lot of mold, uh, but that's what they had. And then uh, between 1946 and uh, uh, 1950, things changed in Poland. The communists tightened their uh, grip. Uh, Wasser, his wife, Rachel Auerbach went to Israel. And then in December 1950, 
uh, Polish construction workers, this here, this here is uh, Wasser and uh, Rochel Auerbach. In 1950, Polish construction workers uh, in December, uh, working, uh, building new apartment houses on the ruins of the former ghetto, uh, came across two aluminum mill cans. And uh, <clears throat> this was the second cache of the archive, which had been buried in uh, uh, February 1943. And the milk cans uh, protected the documents uh, much better than the uh, tin zinc boxes had. Hirschwasser said that they had buried a third cache under the uh, uh, Schwentajerska 34, the brush makers area. Uh, shortly before the outbreak of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. But uh, very, uh, only uh, a scattered page of Schmuel Winter's diary was found there after the war. Uh, there were various attempts to locate this third cache, but it was never found. The site became the site of the Chinese embassy in Poland. There were Israeli searchers who got permission from the Chinese to uh, look some years ago. And I've been told that a new expedition using high-tech gadgets will uh, sh soon ask the Chinese if they can have another chance to find this buried cache. I myself think that it's simply not there anymore. Uh, and so, to make a long story short, on the one hand, it's clear that many documents have been lost, nevertheless, just from that first and second cache, and even keeping in mind all the damage, we have about 35,000 usable documents. And the question then becomes, why is this important? And this goes to the title I chose for my book, Who Will Write Our History? Who Will Write Our History? The Germans thought they would win the war and they would write the history of the people that they murdered. Uh, they would decide how posterity would remember the image of the Jews. And as Emanuel Ringelblum's teacher said in Maidanic just before he died, Isaac Schipper, he said, what we know about murdered peoples is usually what their killers choose to say about them. But the Jews in the Onik Shabbos, Emanuel Ringelblum, and many Jews in other ghettos said, no, even if we don't live to see the liberation, even if we die, we will leave time capsules, bury them under the earth, and someday those time capsules will surface, and the world will remember us on the basis of Jewish sources and not on the basis of German sources. To write was a great act of optimism, because you had to believe that Hitler would lose the war. Otherwise, why bother? And the fact is that we did find those time capsules. And because of those archives in the Warsaw Ghetto and in other ghettos, we can write about the Jews of Poland who were murdered, not just as a faceless mass, not just as faceless victims, but we could write about them as individuals. We could write about their lives. We could write about the community uh, of the ghetto. And yes, it was in some ways a continuation of the pre-war Jewish community. Because of those archives that we found, we are not forced to rely only on German documents. We're not forced to write only about the perpetrators or rely on survivor testimony that willy-nilly in the uh, nature of things uh, would deal with different questions and have different concerns. So in, Ringelblum was fulfilling an important national mission and he did so successfully. And we could see, therefore, that Jews could fight 
not just with guns, but they could also fight with paper and pen. There's a story, perhaps it's apocryphal, but there's a story that the great Jewish historian Shimon Dugnov, before he was murdered in Riga, yelled, Yidin Fashreit, Jews write it all down. Uh, we know that right after the war, under the ruins of crematorium number three in Birkenau, we found glass bottles stuffed with the writings of members of the Sonderkommando. Uh, Hermann Kruk in the Vilna Ghetto kept a diary that ran to hundreds of pages. There were organized archives in other ghettos, Ludge, Vilna, uh, uh, Bialystok. But the Oynik Shabbos archive was the biggest such project uh, in uh, Nazi-occupied uh, Eastern Europe. And it was different from these other archives in many important ways. Uh, it was a real collective. As I said, Ringelblum brought together about 60 people. Uh, he brought religious and secular Jews, rabbis and communists, Zionists and Bundists, men and women, the famous and the not so famous. The core of the archive was a executive committee that would meet every Saturday afternoon, that would chart strategy, that would decide on whom to recruit, that would raise money, that would uh, distribute uh, paper and ink and support uh, to the workers of the archive. Uh, Ringelblum had two uh, secretaries, Eliyahu Gutkowski and Hirsch Wasser, who, who uh, made sure that people met their deadlines and people were taken care of. There was a technical committee uh, composed of Israel Lichtenstein, a teacher, and two teenagers who had physical possession of the materials as they were coming in. And that meant that uh, because so few people knew where the documents were at any particular time, the odds were less that if the Germans caught someone, they would be able to find out the secret of the archive. And as we know, the Gestapo never suspected that such an archive was in existence. The, there was a, a group of copiers. Of course, they didn't have copying machines. So uh, Ringelblum uh, had two or three copies made of each document. There was a group of interviewers who went into the refugee centers where the desperate, the poor refugees expelled from small towns were herded together in terrible conditions, uh, infected with typhus, covered with lice. These interviewers knew that the chances of their getting infected were also very high, but they did this risking their lives to get information uh, for the archive uh, of what was happening to Jews outside of Warsaw. And in fact, many of these interviewers died. So as we see, the archive was well organized. Uh, the uh, Oynik Shabbos was different from other ghetto archives, also in the sheer ambition of its agenda. Uh, the first agenda uh, priority, which begins when the archive is organized in 1940, is to zamel, the Yiddish word to collect, to collect diaries, to collect essays, to collect uh, the menus of the fancy restaurants where the small strata of wealthy Jews uh, were still able to eat, uh, to collect uh, uh, tram tickets, to, to collect doorbell instructions, how many rings for each of the five or six or seven families living in one apartment. Ringelblum was very, very conscious of the importance of giving posterity a sense of the material culture of the ghetto. What was it like to actually live in the ghetto? In 1941, the executive committee of the archive decided on yet a second major agenda item. They decided to organize a comprehensive study of Jewish society in occupied Poland. 
uh, a study which was to run to 1,600 pages and uh, which included 80 different topics, eight zero. Uh, women under the Nazi occupation, religious life, corruption, children, the Jewish police, German-Jewish relations, Polish-Jewish relations. Each topic had a study leader, as you might say, who developed uh, 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 questions for, in for, for interviews, uh, 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 questions to guide the gathering of information. Some members of the Oynik Shabbos were study leaders of three, four, five different topics. And uh, this whole project re also reflects the fact that Ringelblum and most of the executive committee had been involved in the YIVO, Y-I-V-O, the Yiddish Scientific Institute organized in Vilna before the war. The YIVO was devoted to studying the living Jewish people in Eastern Europe in real time, in their language, Yiddish, in such a way as to bring together scholars and ordinary Jews in a common national project to gather information, uh, to uh, create new archives, which would make it possible to see the Jewish people not as a religious community, but as a national group. This YIVO emphasis on interviewing, this YIVO emphasis on reaching out to ordinary people, this was a, a became a foundation of the Oynik Shabbos approach in the Warsaw Ghetto. And you might say that the Oynik Shabbos was simply a continuation of the YIVO. This project was in full swing when in July 1942, the uh, destruction of the Warsaw Ghetto began. And uh, at that point, the last week of July 1942, Emanuel Ringelblum ordered his two secretaries to go to everybody and uh, get their uh, unfinished materials, their unfinished essays, their unfinished questionnaires, just pick it up and take it to this, uh, 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 what, what I call the, uh, the group around Liechtenstein. And on August 3rd, 1942, they took those materials and they shoved them into the tin zinc boxes. So this project was cut short, but nevertheless, what survived of it is extremely valuable for our understanding Jewish society under the Nazi occupation. And now in the summer of 1942, the archive entered a period of uh, crisis, of uh, physical uh, uh, danger and of uh, mental agony. During that summer of 1942, as the Germans were deporting 7,000 Jews a day to Treblinka, uh, Ringelblum, uh, you could sense that he's on the verge of a breakdown. Uh, he doesn't write complete sentences. Uh, he is uh, uh, torn between his natural a uh, sense of obligation to his wife and son to hide, to, to, to help them survive, and his sense of obligation to the archive. Uh, there, every day, another key member of the archive is taken away. The 60 become 50, become 40, become 30. And as their world is collapsing all around them, you might naturally ask, why did they keep on working? Why didn't they just uh, uh, collapse? Why did they persevere? And a partial answer might be found in an essay written by uh, a woman, uh, Gustava Yaretska, who Ringelblum had asked to walk through the streets of the ghetto in that terrible summer of 1942 and write down everything she saw. The reason why Ringelblum thought Yaretska could do this 
was because she was a stenographer for the Judenrat. She had a Judenrat pass. And so Ringelblum thought that she might be uh, uh, protected from the roundups. And she, uh, Yaretska, who, who wrote in Polish and who'd been a, a member of the Polish Socialist Party before the war, wrote this amazing document, which was found in the milk cans after the war. And one of the things she said was she didn't finish it because she and her two children were, in fact, taken away and murdered. Uh, but, but she did say this. She said, we how could we be uh, blamed for having thought that the history of mankind is a, a story of moral improvement, of moral progress, uh, and an upward journey from savagery to civilization to decency? And now as I see the Germans, the members of the most civilized, educated uh, nation in Europe murdering children on the street, how could I have known that it was just the opposite, that in fact history is going towards savagery and not towards decency? And if that is the case, she said, if that is the case, and I'm quoting her directly, let my writings be like a stone under history's wheel, like a stone under history's wheel, hoping therefore that someday if someone were to find what she wrote, they would say, oh my God, how could we have allowed this to happen? Let's make sure that such a, a terrible mass murder never happens again. During 1942, uh, a very few escapees from the killing centers arrived in the Warsaw Ghetto, one from Chelno and maybe five or six from Treblinka. Uh, they were taken in hand by the Oynik Shabbos archive. They were debriefed and interviewed in great detail. And so the archive collected the first accounts of the uh, murder in the gas chambers. One escapee from Treblinka, uh, Avram Kshapitsky, uh, was debriefed by Rochel Auerbach, and that interview runs to about 100 type pages in Yiddish. He was in Treblinka for almost two weeks before he escaped. His detail was so uh, was 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 uh, so meticulous that uh, the archive uh, was able to draw a map of the camp. They were able to learn that the color of the tiles inside the gas chambers. Uh, they learned the details of the whole process. Uh, and based on those interviews and based on other information that they got in the course of 1942, uh, together with the Bund and using the channels of the Polish underground, the archive was able to send four detailed reports to London, to the Polish underground government in London. The last report was sent in November 1942 with all the details of Treblinka. And the Polish underground government then passed that on to the Americans and uh, the British. Ringelblum's watchword for the whole archive, Ringelblum's motto for the whole archive was to right now, W-R-I-T-E, to write everything down now, don't wait, uh, and don't decide that uh, what's important and what's not important. Everything you see, you just write it down because you don't know if you'll be alive tomorrow or you don't know if something will happen to you today that will turn you into a totally different person. Uh, everything is important and don't wait. And he understood also, as a trained historian, he intuited the fundamental difference between survivor testimony, this testimony of people who will have survived the war, and real-time testimony from people in a ghetto, not knowing what's going to happen tomorrow, living in a community that is on the abyss, that is under terrible pressure, but that still exists in some way as some kind of a community. And it's because of the 
testimony that the archive was collecting in real time that we are able to understand the hopes, the aspirations, the values of Polish Jewry uh, at, the, at the very final period before the destruction. And this is important for historians. One example, Cecilia Slapakova, who Ringelblum asked to supervise the study of Jewish women under the German occupation. And Slapakova interviewed many people, women from all backgrounds, from a PhD to a librarian to a high-class prostitute. And uh, she began to write her uh, conclusions in May 1942, and this essay survived. And she said, the Jewish women have shown beyond a doubt that uh, compared to men, they have much more psychological resilience. They're much less prone to depression. As time has gone on, the burden of keeping the ghetto going, the soup kitchens, uh, the uh, children's centers, the, the, the house committees have fallen more and more on women. And I am sure that when the war is over, the Jewish woman will not allow herself to be uh, sent back into the kitchen. She will demand a place at the table. Now, let's assume that Slapakova had uh, survived uh, uh, Majdanek or, or had survived the death marches, had wound up in a DP camp, had remarried, had a new family, arrived in uh, Israel or in the United States, and her grandkids say, ask her, Safta, write down what happened to you. Would she even have remembered that the Warsaw Ghetto was anything more than a holding pen for the death camp? She knew what happened later, and she would have focused on the story of her own uh, uh, survival. So thanks to Ringelblum, we hear the different voices of Polish Jewry at the very end. Uh, children's essays gathered from the, all the ghetto schools, written in Hebrew, Yiddish, and Polish in June 1942. Essays, What Do I Want to Be After the War? The uh, deep uh, uh, religious uh, thoughts and, and uh, 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 questionings of the Piasechner Rebbe, uh, Kalonymus uh, Shapiro. Uh, a seemingly routine note by an ordinary Jewish woman who hosts other women uh, at a meeting of her house committee, trying to draw up a list of children in the building who were starving to death and trying to match them with other families in the building who might be able to give them a meal. The writings of a ghetto mailman and also a great Yiddish writer, Peretz Opachinsky, who sees in the middle of the great deportation, Jewish toddlers sitting on a bench in the hot sun. Their parents are gone. They're crying for their mothers and fathers. And any Jews who try to approach them to give them food or water are beaten by the Germans. And Opachinsky writes, the Germans didn't have to leave that bench there. They could have taken those kids away, but they left it there just so we Jews could suffer just a little bit more, just a little bit more. Then there was another uh, writing found in the milk can. This was written by a Yiddish writer, Shia Perla, who was murdered in Auschwitz in 1943. And I am 99% sure that if he'd survived the war, he never would have written this. But uh, I want to talk about this in a, little more, in a little bit more detail because it's important. On August 25th, 1942, Perla saw a Jewish policeman dragging a little boy to his SS handler and saying, this is my fifth head of the day. The Jewish police, as you know, had to provide so many quote unquote heads, uh, thinking that, that in that way, they would save their skins and save their families. The SS man calmly took out his pistol, murdered the little boy and said, this little dog, 
doesn't count uh, as a head. Go and find me an adult. And the Jewish policeman scampered off to find an adult. And Perla came back and he was so angry. He said, a people that can produce such scum as the Jewish police is a people that deserves what it's getting. Now, after the war, as we know, it was the six million Kadoshim, the six million martyrs. We didn't speak ill of, of, of the Jews who were murdered. But this document shows us a very important difference between wartime writing and post-war writing. A lot of wartime Jewish writing is full of anger against other Jews. And keep in mind that if you look at the writings of, say, Yitzhak Katznelson or Avram Levin, they see the destruction of Polish Jewry, which was the cultural center of Ashkenazi Jewry. They see the destruction of the Jewish people. They see what they believe are instances of, of demoralization and corruption within the Jewish community, and they have no way of knowing that there will be a Jewish state after the war. Uh, and, and, and it's very easy to, to give way to anger and depression and rage, and this is exactly what Perla is doing. Now, you might ask, well, why did Ringelblum put this into the archive? He read it. Uh, why didn't he just tear it up and say, well, this doesn't make the Jews look good. I'm not going to include it. Well, he was a historian, and he did not believe in alternative facts. He believed in telling an honest story, including everything, because in that way, posterity would have more respect for the information that was gathered in the archive. He also was determined that people remember the Jews, not as stereotypes, not as fighting heroes or as collaborators or as Jewish policemen or as religious Jews singing Anima Amin, but that posterity remember the diversity of uh, the Polish Jewish community and remember them not as faceless individuals, uh, uh, not as faceless victims, but as individuals. And that these were people living in a world of choiceless choices, to paraphrase Lawrence Langer. But there's something else. By telling these kinds of stories, which are obviously quite negative and quite damning, Ringelblum wanted to convey something else. He wanted to convey the fact that, uh, as he said, and uh, this, is, this is very interesting, that if you look at the Warsaw Ghetto, a superficial look at the ghetto would give you the impression that uh, there's a lot of corruption. There are the collaborators, the Jewish policemen, the Gestapo agents, and it's kind of like a big pot of boiling water, and the top level of water is, is seething. But deep down, the part you don't see, those are the hundreds of thousands of Jews who were fighting to maintain their decency, their humanity, helping their neighbors, keeping their family together, working in the House committees, and he believed that if you tell an honest story in the archive, that will be the upshot. That's what people will take away in the long run, that the community is defined not by those who were demoralized, but by the great majority who did the best they could. Now, who was Emanuel Ringelblum? Uh, we're, we're getting low on time, so I'm going to uh, skip over what I wanted to say about Ringelblum before the war. Just suffice it to say that uh, he was born in 1900 in uh, Buchach, uh, Galicia. He was a cousin of Shai Agnon. Uh, he belonged to that generation that came of age. Uh, at a time when the Balfour Declaration and the Bolshevik Revolution 
and the establishment of an independent Poland confronted Jewish youth with all kinds of ideological existential uh, choices. Uh, before the war, Ringelblum wore th three hats. The first hat was a devoted member of the uh, Linke Pilot Sion, the left labor Zionists. Uh, and in that movement, he uh, uh, cherished uh, the memory of Ber Barachov, and he kept within his heart a deep devotion to the Jewish masses and to Yiddish culture. And this is something he took with him right until the end. Uh, it was in the party that he found his wife, uh, uh, Yudita, and they had one son, Yuri, who was the apple of his eye. His second hat was in communal organizing, working uh, uh, for the Joint Distribution Committee uh, to, to help impoverished Jews help themselves. And this is what took him to Zbonchen in 1938 to help German Jews who had been uh, uh, expelled by the Nazis just before uh, Kristallnacht. The third half that Ringelblum wore was as a historian. He got a PhD from Warsaw University in uh, 1926. And being a left-wing Marxist, uh, Ringelblum's view of Jewish history uh, was one that tried to revise the view that Jewish history is a story of rabbis and religious texts uh, his view of Jewish history was that it's a story of ordinary Jews, of forgotten Jews, women, apprentices, beggars. Uh, and to do this kind of history, you need new kinds of sources. Ringelblum saw the Jewish historian as a soldier fighting uh, for Jewish rights, uh, uh, showing Poles that uh, the Jews had been in Poland for centuries. They were not aliens, they were not parasites, they'd helped build the country, and at the same time showing Jews that Jews were not simply defined by this idyllic picture of poor and, and a wealthy holding hands going to shul on Shabbat. Jewish history was as Isaac Schiffer, his teacher, said about the weekday Jew and not just about the Shabbos Jew. On the fourth day of the Battle of the Warsaw Ghetto, Ringelblum was sent to Travniki by the Germans where he made a daring escape. And he ended up in a hideout in South Warsaw uh, with uh, 37, 38, 39 other Jews, depending on how you count. This hideout was uh, maintained by a Polish family with financial help from uh, the uh, Jewish uh, underground organizations. In that hideout, from August 1943 until March 1944, Ringelblum wrote, and we know from two people who escaped and who arrived in Israel after the war, the, the uh, Gurs who worked at the Weizmann Institute, that uh, that hideout was very, very, uh, uh, the atmosphere was very tense. People lived in fetid air in the dark. There were conflicts. They were, uh, they had no room to turn around. They lived in constant fear. And Ringelblum just sat in a corner writing. And uh, he wrote hundreds and hundreds of pages. And a courier would come and give him paper and ink and take what he wrote. He wrote about the Jewish intelligentsia. He wrote about the Warsaw Ghetto uprising. And it was in that hideout that he wrote his masterpiece, Polish-Jewish relations in the Second World War. And you could tell the emotional pressure that he was under. Uh, you could sense that he felt that he was the last Jewish historian left in Poland, and he had to get it right. He couldn't make a mistake. And so this Marxist compares himself in the introduction to a cipher, to somebody who writes a Torah scroll. And he says, a cipher cannot make a mistake in the text, and he has to go to a mikvah to purify himself. And this is how I feel. 
he wanted to uh, uh, make sure that uh, the story of centuries of two people living side by side, a story that was now ending in bitterness and, and, and hatred, received some form of correction, fighting the stereotype that not all Poles were vicious anti-Semites, but also fighting the stereotype that the Poles did all they could to help the Jews. He bent over backwards to be fair, uh, to pay tribute to uh, Polish courage, to the difficulties of helping Jews encountered by uh, Poles. Uh, he paid a tribute uh, to the Poles' sense of honor, to their resistance. But then he went on to say in a, da in a damning way that while it was the Germans who started the Holocaust, and while it was the Germans who were fundamentally responsible for the mass murder of uh, Jews, uh, and while Poles certainly did not have an easy time, even if they wanted to help Jews, uh, they could have, but they did not, for the most part, show the Jews the empathy and the moral support that they could well have done. And he cited a story that he just heard, that the Germans were chasing a fleeing Polish resistance fighter through the streets of Warsaw, and all they had to do was yell, catch the Jew, and Polish passerby willingly stepped forward to catch this fleeing fighter. And Ringelblum concluded that for the most part, the Polish nation did, and the Polish underground and the Polish uh, underground government did not pass the moral test. On March 7th, 1944, the bunker was discovered and all the Jews and, the, and uh, two Poles were taken to the Paviak prison. We know from the Yiddish journalist Yechiel Hirschhout something about Ringelblum's last days. Some of the prisoners at Paviak hoped that they might be able to spirit Ringelblum out of the death cell. And Hirschhout went into the death cell to see, uh, to outline a plan whereby they might pay off some guards and get Ringelblum transferred to another cell. Ringelblum had been badly uh, beaten. Uh, his son was sitting on his lap. Hirschhout outlined his plan. Uh, Ringelblum pointed to his son. What about him? No, we can't take him. And Ringelblum said, no, I won't leave my wife and son. Uh, and the last words that Hirschau clearly remembers Ringelblum saying in Yiddish, Was is our schuldig der Kleiner zu lieben, weitig mir stark das Herz. Why is this little one guilty? Because of him, my heart is breaking. On March 10th, uh, all of the prisoners from the bunker, including the two Poles, were murdered. I want to end this talk by going back to the night of August 3rd when Israel Lichtenstein and those two teenagers buried the first cache uh, of the archive, and they were writing their last wills and testaments. The Germans had already deported 100,000 Jews. And those last wills and testaments survived. And Israel Lichtenstein wrote, I want to be remembered. I want my wife, Gela Sextine, an artist to be remembered. She designed sets for the uh, uh, children's theater in the ghetto. And I want my little daughter, Margalit, to be remembered. She's 20 months old, but she equals four-year-olds in intelligence. And if you don't believe me, here are, are the names of some of the teachers who could tell you that. I believe that the Jews of Eastern Europe are a redeeming sacrifice for the Jewish people. The Jewish people will survive. And so in his last months of life, Liechtenstein reminded us that the Jews of Poland were not helpless victims, but they were part of a, a resilient nation and uh, that they were individuals with people with names and people with families and people who wanted to live. And this is the real legacy of the Oynik Shabbos. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Kassau. I think uh, we're all still uh, trying to catch up with everything that you uh, explained uh, today. Uh, there are a few questions. Uh, I'll start with the first question. Actually, um, 
there's a question that is about uh, yours, his book, Mila 18. Um, and we have a question. I'm just going scrolling through. I found it. Okay. Uh, Leon Urs's book, Mila 18, is about the Warsaw Ghetto and has a character based on Ringelblum. Uh, she doesn't remember the name, Sarah Gabai. Do you know how true the story is that yours wrote? I read it so long ago yeah, that I don't even want to go there. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah uh, I was Googling as well to check, but I couldn't. Uh... <laughs> I wrote okay. that in another lifetime. Yeah. Um, also, uh, Hank Greenspan uh, is asking, he, he actually writes, you've written uh, with subtlety about Ringo Bloom's evolving views on demoralization in the ghetto. Was there significant disagreement about this within the OS group? About demoralization? Yes, yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and I mean, this is a, a good opportunity, you know, to, to mention the work of uh, Amos Goldberg, who, who is trying to provide some corrective to our idea of Amida or of resilience or of resistance. And of course, one could say that uh, we also have to consider uh, demoralization or uh, depression or in fact, German successes in, uh, in crushing people. Ringelblum writes about conversations uh, between ghetto intellectuals. Mm. And there were some ghetto intellectuals who said, and this is true in the Vilna ghetto too, we, we, we read what Zelda Kalmanovich said, that in the Middle Ages, the Jews were better prepared to resist persecution because they had more moral armor. They were rooted in, in Jewish faith. They were rooted in Jewish tradition. And uh, their inner selves were protected. But the secular Jew is caught between two shores. He could no longer take refuge in the Torah. But on the other hand, uh, progressive, liberal, humane, universal European society has spit in his face, mm -hmm. and he's left with nothing. And uh, these Jews are pathetic. And there were attempts to say that not only has the secular Jewish experience, the secular Jewish experiment failed, what Benjamin Harshav calls the modern Jewish revolution, but that it has left a whole a uh, section of the Jewish people emotionally bare and vulnerable. Now, Ringelblum listens to all these arguments, and, and then he goes back and forth, and then he writes sometime in late 42 or early 43, I've thought about this and thought about this. Are Jews more corrupt than other peoples? And he says, no. Uh, that when I think about this, uh, the Jewish people as a whole passed the test. They did okay. They did not act worse than others. And he wanted to emphasize the positive, the, uh, the resilience, and the uh, toughness of the Jewish masses. Now, you might say this reflects the fact that he was in the Polish Sea on Smol, that he was a Marxist, that he couldn't uh, uh, concede that the Germans had, had uh, crushed the Jewish spirit. But be that as it may, that's what he believed. Okay. Uh, uh, there's another question, a little different. You actually mentioned Rugeblum's wife. Uh, uh, an artwork, uh, somebody's asking if there is uh, artwork as well in the archive. There's a lot, there's a lot. Now, 36 volumes, 37, I think if you count the index, I might be off by, by one, but uh, people in Warsaw like uh, Lena Bergman and uh, Katarzyna Persson have supervised the publication of 36 or 37 volumes of of the archive uh, and the la and the publication project is finished, and an entire volume is devoted to the artwork of Gellis Sextine, 
there's also uh, uh, artwork by uh, Teitelman, by uh, Nehemia Teitelman. Uh, so yeah, there, there, there is some uh, artwork, mostly of Gela Sextine, mm. but, uh, but other artists too. Yeah, and that's what also a part of the everything that you were saying, that there were historians and there were teachers and there were writers. And of course, artists would have to be a part of that as well. Um, someone is asking, uh, I think it's a Gladwin, uh, Lehman, anything about Janusz Korczak and the orphanage in the archive? Yes, yes. Uh, although it's interesting that Ringel Bloom, while he, of course, had respect for Korchak. At the same time, he was very ambivalent, to put it mildly, about the example that Korchak set. Hmm. Because Ringelblum really believed that it was important for the Jewish intelligentsia to survive if, if they could. And there were people, of course, who very much disagreed with him. Uh, Shmuel Winter, uh, who was a very key member of, of uh, the Oenik Shabbos, as Rochel Auerbach says, when Shmuel Winter heard that uh, there was an attempt to collect money to save writers and poets and communal leaders, and, and Ringelblum was part of that project. Uh, that was money that financed the hideout that Ringelblum was eventually caught in, Vinter said, what? Who's going to decide who lives and uh, who dies? But Ringelblum thought that Korchak's example uh, was a bad example. But the, the another way of putting this is that Korchak was not the only one. There were many, many, many caregivers, teachers, and many ghettos in many uh, situations who... Uh, might have saved themselves at least for a few months more, but accompany children to to their deaths. So Korchak is the best known, but but there were many others. Right, there were many others. Uh, thank you. I think that's a very interesting perspective. Um, just as an educator, the way we talk about Janusz Korchak in uh, in our in the children's museum and uh, and actually what you're saying this it's a dilemma like you said choices choices we really yeah. don't have uh, a choice um, I'm seeing if there's and there are 28 messages that I haven't seen uh, many thank yous and many people are sharing links to, for more information because there are a lot of questions about where can we find more um, I think. Okay, there's another question by Maggie Leone, and I think maybe that may be the last question. In researching the Warsaw Ghetto, I've seen some conflicting things. Do you know if the Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto were forced to wear yellow stars sewn into their clothing or white armbands? That comes up a lot. White, white yeah. armbands because it was in the general government. Exactly, and there are actually photographs, of course, in our archives as well, uh, showing the pictures, um, the difference between the two. Um, I just want to see if there's any more questions before we finish. Um, right. Well, someone else was asking about art. I think that you gave an answer. It was an organized art documentation, and you answered that. Very interesting, because many people know about Terezin, but maybe not as much about uh, well, Warsaw. I, I, well, I just want to add that Adam Chernyakov, the head of the Judenrat, uh, went out of his way to support Jewish artists in uh, the ghetto and bought their paintings and, and hung them in the Judenrat offices. And mm -hmm. Rochel Auerbach has a whole chapter about the Jewish artists in uh, the ghetto. Uh, someone is asking about the name. Uh, did you address, uh, Beth Chernoff mm -hmm. is asking the significance of uh, Oinik Shabbos. I'm going back to the Yiddish, not the Oinik Shabbat. Uh, is, there an, is, is there a reason for choosing that name? Is it an optimistic outlook? Well, I think it's because they met on, on Shabbos afternoons. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with you, but I, I do have to say that on the one hand, you were talking about the secular Jew and that there has to be the week-long Jew and not just the Shabbat Jew. Actually, the name, Onik, Onik Shabbat, or Onik Shabbos, reminds us that there is this special day of the week uh, where Jews get together, even if it's for a secular celebration. So... Yeah, and remember that these uh, Ringelblum was a Yiddishist, but as uh, Peretz said in the Golden Akate, and this is engraved on uh, on uh, his tomb, uh, 
you know, the golden decade, the, the, the highlight is uh, when the Rebbe refuses to make Abdullah and may, may there be Shabbos forever. And, and yeah. that's the dream. It is a dream. Yeah. And I think, you know, just by, I'm thinking about the poets that contributed and the diarists that contributed to uh, Oynik Shabbos. I think that for them, just the physical writing of their stories was something that kept them alive. Yeah, yeah. And that's also an important point. And I think maybe even for Ringo Bloom, I, I'm, I'm sure he understood that, that I, I, he said goodbye to many people that just went through the great deportation and and passed on and they were contributing and suddenly they're gone. So uh, that must've been very difficult uh, to, to have to survive himself. Um, I think that we are finished with our questions. There are about 40 or 50 thank yous uh, for a very interesting uh, lecture. Um, and I wanna thank you again for sharing uh, all that you know and all that you've researched. You are the expert on uh, Oynik Shabbos archive and we were so happy that you agreed to come and speak with us and share your wisdom with our uh, participants from all over the world. I, we had someone writing from Uruguay and from Brazil and of course from the United States and from Europe and Israel. So it's been very uh, a pleasure to meet you as well. And good night, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Todaraba and shalom.